So today we're going to talk about what, I, what I'm going to call, uh, this is my own phrasing, the double latent direct detection of dark matter. So if you recall what we discussed last week, we talked about dark matter detection in gamma rays from space. So two dark matter particles annihilated, they produced light in the form of really high energy photons called gamma rays. Those gamma rays traveled straight to Earth. They were picked up by something like the Fermilab telescope or an atmospheric Cherenkov telescope like Veritas, and, and we saw this light. Now the key part of detecting dark matter in that way was that we knew what the morphology of that signal was supposed to look like. We knew where it was supposed to be on the sky, right? So we know dark matter is, is right near the center of our galaxy, and then there were these dwarf galaxies. And if dark matter was producing photons, each of those things should show up as little bright sources in our telescopes. Um, so we have some directional information, which is important. In doubly indirect detection, we lose that, uh, that, uh, that information about the spatial distribution. But what we're going to talk about is uh, dark matter annihilation, and not the gamma rays, not the light that gets produced, but the other particles that get produced in this dark matter annihilation event, and then what they do. Right? So um, if you remember our, our two favorite plots, they've shown up in every talk since week four. Um, we have indirect detection, we're going this way. We have a dark matter particle and another dark matter particle. They annihilate and they produce standard model particles. Some of those standard model particles are things like light here that we could see. Some of them are electrons and positrons. Some of them are, say, protons and antiprotons. Um, note that dark matter produces equal numbers of particles and antiparticles. So for every proton that gets produced, there is an equal antiproton that gets produced. Okay? Um, and, and we're going to focus for the rest of this on protons and uh, electrons and their antiparticles. Yeah? Okay, can I do just a little bit here on those things? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, now, these, these high energy particles get produced wherever the dark matter annihilation event happens. But then they don't move straight to our detector anymore. There are charged particles, and there are magnetic fields in the galaxy, there are electric fields in the galaxy, and those bend and distort those charged particles that get produced. Right? Uh, just, uh, just like anything. Uh, that you know you have a you have a magnet and you put it in your refrigerator, it gets attracted, it gets bent by the magnetic fields that exist. Which means that by the time it gets to Earth, it's moved around and bounced around in all sorts of directions. I don't know where it came from anymore. Right? So here, here's how uh, cosmic rays, being high energy electrons and protons and other high energy charged particles, move through our galaxy. Um, and it's this sort of like a Brownian motion. Uh, colloquially called the drunkard's walk. Um, so let's say the particle, I don't know actually where the start of this thing is. Kind of I think it starts right there. And it moves this way, then it moves a little bit this way, moves a little bit that way, moves a little bit this way. And it bounces around in some sort of weird thing. Eventually it came out over here. But uh, I would have no, just seeing a particle here doesn't tell me which part of this box it originated in. Could have originated anywhere and bounced around randomly. Um, so I lose that morphological information. Of course, it's called the drunkard's walk because it's, it's like a man walking home from a bar or a woman, and they just kind of move in whichever direction they move in, and hopefully they eventually diffuse home. Um, so um, we think the magnetic fields in our galaxy are predominantly random, meaning that the magnetic field, whatever direction it points somewhere near the sun, is not the same direction it points somewhere else that's not too far away, which is not the same direction it points you know, near the galactic center, and it's just kind of a random mess. There is some order, and we, we've measured that order in the magnetic field. So here are different directions the magnetic field is pointing. Here's the plane of our galaxy. Um, and you can see that even here it's kind of a mess. So we don't know which way particles are going to move once they get created before they get to our telescope. And it turns out that when we look for these cosmic rays in telescopes on Earth, we find that they come in equal amounts from the same from every direction. They, we basically have lost all the information about where they came from. <laughs> these cosmic rays move through the magnetic fields, they move through the electric fields. Not only do they lose all of the information about what direction they came from, um, they lose energy, or they gain energy. 
right? They have interactions with other particles um, in our galaxy, and that changes how, how the particles look by the time they get to us. So for protons, we have uh, mainly what I'll call hadronic interactions, the same sort of things that happen at the LHC. We made a really high energy proton in our dark matter annihilation event. It hits a hydrogen nucleus, which is another proton. Uh, they go boom. They produce a bunch of new particles, uh, electrons, uh, protons, all, all sorts of mess, right? Um, for electrons, we have three different processes, and I realize you can't see the bottom of the screen. Um, electrons lose energy from what's called from Strelung radiation. This is a high energy electron gets close to a nucleus of, say, hydrogen or helium or something like that. It interacts with all the electrons that are surrounding that nucleus, um, and it slows down from these interactions and loses energy. Uh, electrons can move through our galaxy, and they interact with light. There's a lot of light moving in, in the galaxy from all the stars. And uh, this high energy electron comes in, it hits a photon, and that photon gains a lot of the electron's energy, the electron loses energy. Um, electrons can lose energy to what's called ionization. They get close to an atom, and they knock out one of these electrons over here. The electron actually takes away a bunch of the energy as it leaves the nucleus. Um, in general, it's, it's a trend that, say, uh, an electron was produced with a lot of energy, say, uh, a billion electron volts, um, somewhere near the center of our galaxy. It will, in general, lose most of that energy before it ever gets to Earth in these sort of events. Protons are a little better. Most of them don't actually have a, uh, an interaction with another proton before they make it to us. A good number do, not all. So how can we use this to constrain dark matter annihilation? And the key is antiparticles. Dark matter annihilation, like I just said, produces almost equal quantities of matter and antimatter in every event. On the other hand, astrophysics is the acceleration, the production of particles that are mostly matter, because matter is what's mostly in our galaxy. Um, so if I look at, say, the astrophysical background flux, um, on the left here, this is the, the, the flux that we observe on Earth. I'll tell you how we do this in a bit. Uh, in protons, um, and here's how many antiprotons we observe on Earth. We see both of these things. Um, and this plot will be impossible to read, but uh, over here we get you know, 10 to the 4 in these specific units, protons per second. And we get 10 to the minus 2 antiprotons per second. For every uh, antiproton that we observe on Earth, we get a million protons. That's the ratio that astrophysics likes to produce. It's mostly seeing matter particles with very little antimatter. The biggest way that uh, these protons, these high energy protons, with, you know, moving very quickly, billions of electron volts are produced, is what's called Fermi acceleration, uh, named after Mariko Fermi. And this process goes as such. A high energy particle comes in, let's say it's a proton, and there's a, a wall of, of high energy particles moving this way an electric field, maybe from a supernova. A supernova blew up and it produced a shell of really fast moving particles. A proton comes from somewhere else, it hits this shell, and it bounces off. And the, the energy it gains is the original energy it had plus the energy of whatever direction this thing was moving. Right? Um, so it gains energy in this collision. And then maybe it goes over here, there's a shell moving the other way. It bounces off of that shell too. And it gains energy again, because that shell is moving in a different direction. So you have a proton bouncing between different parts of our galaxy that have magnetic fields. right? And what's, what's funny, just, just like uh, you know, traffic, you pass more cars that are moving towards you than you pass cars that are going in the same direction as you. Over time, a proton hits more expanding gas clouds that are moving towards the proton, in which case it gains energy than gas clouds that are moving in the same direction as the proton, where it would lose energy. So over all these collisions, the proton ramps up in energy over time and becomes a very high energy particle that propagates through the, the galaxy. But notice, we have to start with a proton, right? And there are lots of protons in our galaxy, um, in stars, in supernova, et cetera, et cetera, and almost no antiprotons. So that's why um, what we see is almost all matter. So let's look for bumps in this background. When I say a bump, I mean in this ratio of antimatter divided by matter 
at a specific energy, right? So I said there's about a million or a million protons per antiproton, but maybe at some energy there's only 800,000 protons per antiproton, right? That would tell us suddenly we, we were at an energy and we had more antimatter than we used to get. And um, if that happened at a very specific energy, um, acceleration of protons wouldn't give us that. It would just give us a smooth spectrum. So th this isn't protons anymore. This, this plot was made for, uh, for positrons divided by electrons. And here was maybe what you would get from a dark matter sort of thing. Um, dark matter is maybe, say, uh, a, what, what is this? Uh, 25 times the mass of a proton, uh, 25 GeV. And uh, it produces a lot of electrons that have an energy that's very close to the mass of the dark matter particle. A bunch of, a bunch of electrons and positrons right at this range here. But it doesn't produce much down here. So this is all astrophysics. So suddenly, you get this big bump where dark matter is suddenly contributing a lot of the particles you see, but not a lot down here. And that changes that ratio of antimatter to matter in a way that you can detect. The, way that, the reason that this is a really good way to search is this helps control all of our uncertainties. We don't necessarily know how many protons we expect at every energy, right? Um, we don't know how many nearby supernova there were to us, how many particles happened to be in our galaxy, what they got accelerated to. Those are all uncertainties. In astrophysics, it's hard. But we do know what the ratio is supposed to be, in general, between the antiparticles and the particles. So if that changes, we can look for the changes without knowing really what the background uh, number of each was supposed to be. Another way you can look uh, for these charged particles is not through the charged particles that actually make it all the way to our telescope, right? But we can look for, well, these charged particles lose a bunch of their energy, like I just said, as they move through space. A lot of that energy, again, comes in photons. And those photons go right to our telescope, you know, once, once they're created. So we produce, we have dark matter annihilation. It produces charged particles, maybe near the center of our galaxy, right? And those charged particles lose a bunch of their energy near the center of our galaxy, and we'll look for some of that lost energy in the form of light that we can see from Earth. So for instance, here's an electron. Uh, moving through a magnetic field, it's spinning around here, and every time it spins, it produces uh, synchrotron radiation from, from having to turn. Uh, every time it turns, right, you have to change the electron's momentum. So you need momentum coming off in the form of photons, that's uh, synchrotron radiation. And this is a radio signal that you could see with a radio telescope. And maybe you'll get something like this coming from the galactic center, and you'll have some way of determining that it looks like dark matter. This is best for electrons, because like I said, they lose most of their energy pretty effectively as they move through the galaxy. Protons lose less energy, they travel farther, it's harder to get this sort of signal out. What's interesting is you get a little bit of morphology here, right? I said in the galactic center, and then they lose energy and bounce around the galactic center. Um, so if you know a region that's bright, and it has a lot of dark matter annihilation, you'll expect more signal there. But you won't know exactly where it's supposed to come from because that depends on how the electrons move before they lose their energy. And so it depends on what exactly is the magnetic field in that region, uh, how tangled is the magnetic field in that region, all sorts of uncertainties. So you get a little of uh, information about the morphology here, but not much. So I'm, I'm going to split these two different ways to look for dark matter over the rest of this talk into, into two subsections. Looking for the charged particles themselves and entirely the antiparticles. Um, when they get to Earth, and then looking for emission from charged particles that get produced, and then produce light themselves somewhere around our galaxy. Okay. So, the first thing you could look for are antiprotons, the antiparticle of the proton. And you could say, um, do I see excess antiprotons compared to what I predict um, from astrophysics? To do this, you need some sort of model for how many protons, antiprotons, and other things you want, you expect to see in, your, in the galaxy, right? This means I need some way to go between how many protons do I think are produced in the galaxy, which I can calculate basically by how many supernova there are, how many big stars there are, that sort of thing. How many get to me? 
which is a question of how do these particles bounce around once they get into the crazy magnetic fields of the galaxy? How many of them just fly right out of the galaxy without losing energy? How many get stuck near the disk of the galaxy, et cetera, et cetera? So you need a big uh, simulation code to do this. Uh, the one I usually use is called Galprop. There's another one called Dragon, uh, which I haven't used. Um, so it takes some distribution of charged particles from astrophysics. You can add in dark matter later, but from astrophysics. And it bounces them around in our galaxy and calculates how many get to my telescope where the sun is. Um, and so, you know, it produces some measurement of charged particles, or, or some si uh, simulation of charged particles that looks like these different lines. And then you compare this to your data, uh, which looks like this. And one thing that you try to look for, um, so what I call, um, what I call, what everybody calls for the last 40 years before I was born, um, the primary to secondary ratio, um, which is uh, another way of getting rid of uncertainties. Um, I should mention there's a lot of technical things here. I'm just trying to get a, get a, a gist of this picture. Um, so some things we know are formed a lot in supernova. Supernovas produce lots and lots of iron. That's why there's lots of iron on Earth, because it came from previous supernova somewhere in our universe. Um, the reason that we know that supernova produces lots and lots of iron is because iron is a very stable nucleus. It has a very low energy, and so a lot of it gets produced. Some things get produced really easily in supernova, and some things don't. So when I say, here's where the supernova are, and here are the sort of charged particles I want to produce, um, I know how much of each different species I'm supposed to produce based on the stability of those different nuclei in supernova events. So for instance, here I'm looking at two different, not, not just a proton anymore, but I'm looking at, you know, collections, atoms, of boron or carbon. Um, it turns out that, um, what is it, uh, carbon is produced lots in, in supernova, a lot. Uh, that's why there's a lot of carbon on Earth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, boron is not produced in supernova because boron isn't particularly stable. Um, but we see boron by the time it gets to our detector. Why? Because boron is lighter than carbon, and sometimes the carbon atom moving through our galaxy hits a gas atom, and sometimes that breaks apart the carbon into a proton and boron. Right? So we, we started with no boron, when the supernova happened, essentially no boron. By the time we got, the particle got to us, some of it had hit other gas and become boron. And we can calculate from uh, nuclear physics experiments how often that happens. We can calculate it based on how much gas it went through. So the boron to carbon ratio tells us at different energies of boron and carbon, how much gas do these, do these nuclei tend to go through between the time that they were ejected from a supernova and the time they got to Earth. So it tells us uh, basically how much gas there is in, in the average travel time for a nucleus uh, from the time it was injected to the time it gets to the sun. Another one is, um, and this is a little conceptually easier to understand, is, is what's called the beryllium 10 to 9 ratio. Um, beryllium, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess this up. Beryllium-9 is produced uh, in supernova. Beryllium-10 um, is also produced, but is an unstable element. Beryllium-10, or sorry, yeah, beryllium-9 decays into beryllium-10. That's the way it works. Um, so, at, so this actually tells us how long after the supernova event the particle's been bouncing around until it gets to us. Because after, over time, all of the, the beryllium uh, I think I might be saying this backwards. One of these things, which I don't remember which one, is going to decay into the other one. So over time, um, I'm going to get rid of all of one of them, and I have them backwards now in my head. And uh, I will have a pure sample of the other one. I can, I can guess this, because at low energies, things stay in the galaxy longer, and this ratio is smaller, so it must be beryllium 10 going way into beryllium 9. Good. Um, so this tells me that at really low energies, cosmic rays stay longer in our galaxy, really high energies they go away. Good. We got through that together. <laughs> um, 
So I have two different things. I say, how much gas did I go through in general before I got, went from a supernova and got the particle to Earth? How long did that take? Those are two really good constraints, because I know a third thing. I have observations of where gas is in the galaxy. So that gives me an idea of where these particles tended to travel on average between the time they left a supernova and got to Earth. So that kind of constrains our models of how these particles bounce around. Okay, we have a nice model now. A lot of uncertainties in magnetic fields, in the structure of how these things bounce around, in how fast they lose energy. Uh, I think probably a uh, 150 parameters you can tune in some of these models. It's kind of a mess. You compare this to data taken by uh, telescopes that are in space or on balloons high in the atmosphere and measure the charged particles that actually get to the Earth. Um, so one of these is called the Pomelo mission. Uh, it was launched in 2006, still taking data, um, and it's measuring basically um, the, the energy and the type of particle that is moving through this detector everywhere in space. A newer one is the uh, AMS-02 mission. It's uh, attached to the International Space Station, as you can see here. It's the biggest mission on the International Space Station, in fact. It has a high power requirement, which is why it needs to be on something big like the ISS. Um, and it's collecting lots and lots of data about different particles, um, what type, what energy. You can also do this with balloons. You take a balloon of hot gas, you put it in Antarctica, you launch it up really, really high in the atmosphere, maybe uh, 100,000 feet or something like that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how high hot balloons get nowadays. They're really, they, they go really up there. Uh, and then you measure things up right in the top of the atmosphere. You're so high up in the atmosphere that uh, most of the particles haven't collided with the atmosphere yet, so you can still measure them. There's a hint of an excess um, in antiprotons, which is the, the key thing that you want to look for. How many protons do you expect? How many antiprotons do you expect? How many do you observe of each? Constraining our models of of how many we expect based on these primary to secondary ratios of things like boron to carbon. Um, so here are some measurements of the expected number of antiprotons. Um, these are, see, Pamela is here in uh, red. There's some balloon-based experiments like Bess here in black. Uh, AMS isn't on this plot yet, though they have data. They, this plot came out before AMS did. Um, here's the band of uncertainties by running like a bunch of Galprop models. <laughs> a lot of Galprop models, it's wasting computer time. And uh, you, you get this, and this is how many antiprotons you expected at different energies. The data points is how many you've got. And this comes in some sort of residual. There's some excess here at low energies. Turns out, uh, the paper I worked on uh, last month with Dan Hooper, um, you can model that in terms of dark matter. Uh, you can plot this back to that normal plot that we've always seen, the dark matter mass and how often dark matter particles annihilate their cross-section. And you get this big black blob thing. Um, the red and blue things are what I'm going to talk about next lecture. Um, so, okay, maybe there's a hint. <coughs> but there are a lot, a lot of those things. I wrote the paper, I'm not that confident. Um, so you could have a different propagation mechanism. You don't have to use kind of the default Galprop numbers. You can use numbers from any different sort of model of cosmic ray motion that you might want. Here's another one we put in our paper, and everything goes down quite a bit uh, when you try it. Here's another model that a group, uh, Marco Sorelli uh, and some collaborators put out, where the astrophysics matches everything perfectly in terms of data, and there's no real need anymore for some sort of dark matter thing. And of course, we don't know how the magnetic fields in our galaxy work. We don't know which one of these models is right. Um, and the constraints are really hard to determine. So um, it's not like we, we I, I shouldn't say we didn't like build a model so that there was an excess that we could fit with, with dark matter. We took kind of a well-established set of models and we, we found an excess. But you can make it easily go away with another model that's totally reasonable. <laughs> this is going to be the theme of doubling and direct detection. Uh, you can always find an excess. Uh, you can always fit it with dark matter, and you can always make it go away with astrophysics. That's, that's kind of the life of this sort of, uh, sort of model. And the reason is really, um, 
the data here is really, really good. My laser pointer stopped working. Uh, the data here is really, really good. Look, the error bars are really small. So it's really easy to find significant excesses just from small fluctuations in this data that, that would need to be fit because the models are not very good. The data in, in, in double and direct detection is way better than the models. Another thing you can look for um, is the positron fraction. So we were looking for antiprotons, right? Antiprotons move through the galaxy pretty effectively. They don't lose a lot of energy. Now let's look for the anti-electrons, the positrons moving through our galaxy, and, and look for some bump in these at a particular energy um, and see if we can model that with dark matter. Turns out there are a ton of excess positrons, like not even a small number. Um, that's what a ton means, not even a small number. Um, <laughs> so here was, uh, this was first, actually, let's go back, let's see. In 1989 with the mass telescope, here's the positron fraction, it's, it's going down for reasons that I won't talk about in this lecture. You expect the positron fraction from astrophysics to do this, just kind of smoothly go down. Um, and there was some hint that it went up, but the statistics here are terrible. There's like two data points that are high. But Pamela came by in 2009 and, and put down these red data points. Clearly, at high energies, the positron fraction starts increasing. The fraction, the fraction of electrons um, and anti-electrons that are anti-electrons, right, starts increasing. Um, which is not what astrophysics predicted. Astrophysics predicted this. Um, AMS02 came out in 2013. Um, and now, the, I mean, their error bars are actually on this plot. You just can't see them. They're way, way too small. Um, this is what they see. Uh, the positron fraction is super clearly increasing. Not what you, not what you expected. Uh, tons and tons of data. This, this is just reality. Great. Huge excess and a huge number of papers. I think this paper's been cited a thousand times now. Uh, so everyone's talking about this, writing down dark matter models. Um, turns out you can model with dark matter pretty easily. Um, in the weeks after the first the, the Pamela paper came out, there were probably already 50 papers doing it with different fun models. Um, because you can do it with lots and lots of models. So here's a paper by uh, Marco Sorelli, uh, some of his collaborators. Um, here was what the background expected to do. Like I said, just supposed to smoothly fall, kind of like this. Here's the Pamela data. So he put in this dark matter signal uh, that produces this part here. And uh, you can see it explains this data. This model happens to be a dark matter particle that's a thousand proton masses, or, or one TeV, um, annihilating to uh, muons and anti-muons, and those produce electrons, uh, positrons. So you see that signal. Um, in fact, you cannot do this with one model. Here's a paper by uh, Elias Cholas, Dan Hooper, and others. They do it with nine different models, and each model they take like six different types of dark matter, and they all work. Everything works. So we found not dark matter, we found 54 types of dark matter here. Um, great. Um, and what you generally needed was a dark matter type of annihilation that produces lots and lots of electron positron pairs. Um, so you wanted, when you talked about this sort of favorite diagram of ours, dark matter annihilates and produces stuff, you wanted lots and lots of the energy to show up over here. Not much energy to show up in antiprotons or protons or something like that. And this signal was so big that that ended up becoming a problem. Making something this bright and produce this many electrons as you'll see in a second, it became an issue. Second issue, immediately at the same time, people thought of an astrophysics to do this. We said, well, astrophysics was just supposed to smoothly fall, but maybe we can come up with alternatives. The alternatives is that um, pulsars, high energy neutron stars, have really strong magnetic fields. Um, and if they produce an electron, the electron in this magnetic field gains a lot of energy. Um, and it can actually um, produce electron-positron pairs. So, um, so you start with an electron, you produce an electron plus an electron plus a positron. That happens again and again and again in a really strong magnetic field. And it turns out that you get a basically an equal number of positrons and electrons out of the end. Um, and uh, so you, you had 
uh, this is a paper uh, by Dan Cooper and some collaborators. So here's the number of uh, pulsars that you form per century. If you form one pulsar per century, you form four, form 10. Here's what you expected in terms of the positron fraction. It's a function of energy, which is you know, going from five times the proton energy to uh, 300. Uh, if you got one, you didn't get enough flux, but if you had like about four uh, supernova forming pulsars per century in our galaxy, you got about the right flux out in positrons. <coughs> Turned out not only could you do that, um, as my, my thesis advisor, Stefano Fumo, pointed out, if you just had a single pulsar that happened to be pretty close to us, um, you could do the exact same thing. Just that pulsar on itself could make this positron fraction rise. It happens to be nearby, you see a lot of its electrons. Great. And it also, uh, it turns out, by the way, um, just a fun fact, uh, everyone said that the model should do this. So I went back into history once and looked for the first model that said the pulsar should do this. It actually came out in 1974. Uh, just everyone forgot about it. Um, so it wasn't like uh, we had to come up with an astrophysical explanation afterwards. Some people who thought about pulsar seriously had already realized this. And for some reason involving physics, it had never made its way into our kind of standard models of how things were supposed to work. Um, so now we have two explanations. We have, we have dark matter explanations that can produce this sort of rising positron fraction. We have pulsar explanations. They do the same thing. There's a few ways to differentiate this, but not a lot. You're kind of stuck in a scenario where both work pretty well. Um, so one thing you'll see is that AMS data, like I just showed, is those red data points there, very small air bars, uh, is starting to turn over, which means that the, the slope is rising really steeply here. You're getting, as you go up in energy, you're getting more and more positrons per electron, but it doesn't continue like that. It starts to come down a little bit. Um, from Pamela, you didn't actually know that. This could have been a straight line that just kept going up. Um, but this looks like it's slowing down. So that tells you something about the, about the types of models that produce this. Um, if you remember the first positron fraction slide I showed right at the beginning of this talk, it went up like this and then it cut off. There was a really sharp line, uh, which happens to be at the mass of the dark matter particle. But uh, here, we're slowing down. We're not seeing a very sharp line. So some of those models are, are ruled out by that sort of thing. Uh, this is another paper, uh, Elias Schultz and Dan Cooper are on it, where they show that these sort of old models, like this is dark matter uh, annihilating and producing electrons directly. So the dark matter annihilates, that's, that's the best way to get electrons out of dark matter, just have dark matter annihilate and make electrons. Good. Um, so here's the positron fraction. You expect it to get steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper, then you get to the dark matter mass and it goes to zero. But this turnover, that's, that's not what you're seeing. So those sort of models don't work anymore. Um, the models I showed from the Sorelli paper where dark matter goes to muons, muons decay into neutrinos and electrons. Um, but those also produce electrons with a lot of energy. They look like that. And as you go to high energies, that doesn't fit the data. Um, but some things, <coughs> oh, did I not show the plot of stuff that works? Oh yeah, there are things that work. I didn't put them on the slide. Um, so you have dark matter and it annihilates to like uh, uh, pions and the pions decay to electrons and stuff like that and that actually works pretty well and it explains this data. I forgot to show that. Good. And so, so what we have now, we have better observations, right? That rules out some of the class of dark matter models, but there's basically an infinite number of models to choose from and some of them are pretty good still. Another thing that happened that's sad for the dark matter scenario um, is that if I annihilate and I produce electrons, right, my annihilation event also needs to produce some gamma rays. Uh, so I, it's hard to go to just electrons and positrons, like I just said. If I produce something like pions and have the pions produced by electrons, which works, those pions also decay and produce gamma rays. And so something like the Fourier telescope that we talked about last week should see that. Because I need lots and lots of electrons out of here, that means I need lots and lots of gamma rays. Um, this red area here, and this is our normal mass of the dark matter particle, going from 100 proton masses to 10,000 proton masses now. Um, and this cross section, how much the dark matter particles collide. This red is what you needed to explain pamela um, with dark matter. And um, 
Now, I, I get to go to the lower signs actually a little bit better. This is the stuff that gets ruled out by, say, Fermi observations of dwarfs that we talked about last week. This is the stuff that gets ruled out by high energy observations of the galactic center with Hess. And you'll notice that this is all in tension now. Most of these models are hard uh, to fit with the lack of a gamma ray signal. Another way to say that is that this was really dark matter. We should have seen it in gamma rays too and been able to confirm our, our predictions. Um, it's intention, again, you can find ways around this. Uh, one thing I'm pointing out for self-biased reasons, because my name's on it, is uh, you can also look for anisotropy. So what I remember what we said from uh, Brownian kind of random walks, is that you, you lose the direction that things came from, right? And that's mostly true. You don't have the directional information anymore. But if a source is really close to you, Right, if there's one source that's making the, the, the positron fraction rise, like a nearby pulsar, um, you will get a little bit of directional information, it, as long as you're not making too many steps before you, from you, when you get from here to here. Right? It's still, if the signal comes in this way, it's still more likely, a little bit, like 1% more likely, it came from over there than over there. Good. Um, and what we found was, um, for, for, for we, we know what the nearby pulsars are that would produce the signal, right, uh, we found. Um, the two that are best are uh, two, uh, two pulsars named Gaminga and Monogem. Here was the anisotropy, the number of uh, electrons that are coming from the direction to the pulsar um, as a fraction, as an excess over the number of uh, electrons that are coming from the opposite direction that's induced by these. So like for, for Monogem, which is going to induce the most anisotropy, it's 0 0.01 here, so there's a 1% higher chance that an electron from monogem comes at us from the direction of monogem compared to the opposite direction. Very small, but you can detect that. You see lots and lots of electrons. Here are the limits right now on how, how often electrons come from all the same directions, and you know it says here at this energy, it's not more than 10% coming from one energy from one direction over the opposite direction. Um, and we want to get down to you know half a percent or something like that. We wrote a paper on how you could maybe try to do that. But that's a possibility in the future. On the other hand, if you never see this, that just tells you it's not one single nearby pulsar, maybe. And maybe it is still if you do the right things in the model. Uh, so it doesn't really tell you much at all. But if you did see the signal, if you did see the anisotropy, that's actually pretty good evidence that it's a uh, that it's a pulsar. So it's, it's a possibility. Another thing you can look for, um, so we've gotten stuck in this problem with antiprotons um, and positrons, where, um, okay, we, we have a way to make it with dark matter, and that dark matter can explain our excess, but there's also a way to do it with background astrophysics. Let's try to think of a scenario where you can't do it with astrophysics, and that's heavier anti nuclear so what's the possibility of not creating an antiproton, but creating an anti-helium atom? Um, or um, what's, what's actually a better constraint is anti-deuterium. Deuterium is a, is a hydrogen with an extra neutron in it. So it's a, two, it's a single proton and a single neutron. Um, that's really hard for technical reasons to make with normal matter. Um, and here is the energy of the anti-deuterium atom. So here's it's kinetic energy, here's one proton mass and energy, so it actually has more mass and has energy, just low energies. Um, here's what astrophysics almost has to do. You get nothing in low energies. Dark matter can produce these sort of things. So here now, uh, dark matter is producing 10 to the uh, 100 billion times as much signal as my astrophysical background. Um, so if I ever saw one of these things, it almost has to be something new. It can't be astrophysics. Um, Unfortunately, um, this is really rare. So uh, this is in the same units as before, where the protons was 10 to the 4. <laughs> antiprotons were 10 to the minus 2. Now this is 10 to the minus 6 or 7. So you're not seeing many of these things. You, you wouldn't have expected any telescope to have seen any of them yet, even from dark matter. But there's a new mission called GAPS, which is being launched soon, um, that's really sensitive to anti-deuterium. And hopefully it can scan a larger chunk of the sky and see these sort of things. So it's something a future observation could do, and then you won't have to worry about this astrophysical background anymore. Yeah? 
if you have radioactive anti-nuclei, is their half-life the same as the normal particle? Uh, yes. In, in theory, it's exactly the same. People try to test this because um, you want some explanation for why antiparticles aren't the exact same as particles because you want a reason that we have particles and not antiparticles in our universe. So some models that explain that would give you differences. Okay. Um, but in, in our general theory of physics, it's exactly the same. Uh, the reason I bring it up is you show helium yeah. antiparticles. Of course, the logical conclusion would be why not put tritium also while, while you're doing that? Um, yeah, actually, um, we have, yeah, I actually work on that. Um, so what, what happens is tritium uh, will decay. And so what you actually see is an enhancement in anti-helium and anti-deuterium from tritium decays. Oh, I so see. by the time you see it, it's either anti-helium or it's anti-deuterium. And so these rates get fluctuated a little bit. So you're saying the path is too long. The path is too long. So now tritium okay. decays in 11 years. These are all, oh, oh, I, I should say that. Yeah, good point. Uh, protons and antiprotons uh, can propagate through the galaxy on order of hundreds of millions or billions of years before they, before they reach us. That was, um, that's what the beryllium 10 to 9 ratio tells us, is how long that takes. I didn't tell you the answer, though, which is around a billion years. Ooh. Uh, good. Thank you. Good point. Okay. The other thing you can do is radio surges. Um, we're now. I'm not looking for the charged particles actually getting to Earth. I'm looking for whatever the heck the charged particles are doing once they bounce around after they get created. And there are two um, observations of interest. Um, one was called the W map haze. Uh, it was first pointed out by Doug Finkbeiner uh, in 2004. And remember the WMAP satellite from a couple weeks ago. It primarily looks for the cosmic microwave background radiation. It tells us about the structure and the formation of our universe uh, from the really early, uh, you know, 400 years after the, 400,000 years after the Big Bang up till today. And it gives us a lot of information, but when it looks around our universe to see uh, microwave radiation, it also picks up you know, anything in the galaxy that it happens to be looking through. Um, if you want to do studies of the early universe, you try to subtract that out. If you want to do studies of our galaxy, you might want to look at it. Um, and so Doug was looking at the, uh, the bright signal around our galaxy and found this bright blob of excess microwave emission above and below the plane of the center of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy is here in the middle. There's too much junk in the way, so he just masked out and made black this part uh, going across it. So this was seen by WMF. Uh, out by Doug in 2004. In 2012, Planck saw the same thing. Planck is just the successor satellite to WMAP. It sees, again, uh, it's, again, generically looking for the microwave background. Um, and so they see a bright blob here. I haven't actually subtracted a bunch of other emission yet, so it's, it's not as obvious in this plot, although the data is actually much better. If you look at this emission as you move away from the center of our galaxy, so here's the angle away from the center of the galaxy in degrees. So just kind of moving up, 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 up. Um, it looks like this. It falls off very quickly as you go farther and farther away from the center of our galaxy. This is the map at uh, 22 gigahertz, which is a radio energy. And uh, that's the next energy band up the W map looks at. And uh, you can fit this with dark map, turns out. Um, so here's a, here's a paper I wrote. I was not, I should say, the first person to write a paper that fit this with W map. I was like the 50th. But I picked mine. Um, so here's a, here's a dark matter model. Here's the data from WMAP. And you can see you can produce this emission. So the model is you know, dark matter annihilates. It produces electrons and positrons, mostly near the center of our galaxy. And then those electrons and positrons, they bounce around. They move up and around the galaxy, above, below, sideways. Um, you use something like Galprop to calculate how you think that happens. Um, and then. When you see the electrons are kind of everywhere in the galaxy, they're interacting with the magnetic fields. Uh, they're losing their energy in, in synchrotron, and they're producing the synchrotron signal, and we can see it. Um, so dark matter could make that. Um, or maybe it doesn't, as I also wrote in 2010. Uh, whoops, whoops. This is, uh, let's see if I can get it from there. There we go. Um, 
I wrote before that, okay, maybe we have hard times trying to explain this stuff up here with dark matter because it falls off too quickly. This is a, a famous quote, theorists do not need to be consistent, only their theories need to be consistent. Um, so, you know, you can write both things at the same time, and I don't, whatever. Um, so maybe in some sort of models, in this class of models it didn't work. We went back and we evaluated a different class of models, it worked a lot better. Okay. Um, great. What ended up happening, and I think this story is becoming pretty close to decided, is that the Fermi bubbles were discovered, we talked about them last week, they're those bright gamma ray bubbles above and below the galactic center, and the weird part about them is they have this strong edge, um, which is why we didn't think they were dark matter. So um, the Fermi bubbles were discovered um, by Doug Finkbeiner and his collaborators um, in an attempt to prove that this was really dark matter, which Doug had also seen. So he said, hey, here's the radio signal. Let me go look real quick and find this gamma ray signal. He found it, and then in the gamma rays, it turned out that it had edges. And uh, that edge meant that it probably wasn't dark matter annihilation. Um, and then when we went back, when we, when he and the collaborator went back and looked in WMAP, they found those same edges. So the edges weren't as apparent in, in, in the microwave data as they were in gamma rays. But once you knew where they were, and that it looked like something you should test, um, they went back and they redid the analysis, and they found that, yes, these sharp edges here exist in the radio map too, these are almost certainly being produced by the same thing. Because we have strong reasons to believe that the gamma ray signal is not from dark matter, we think that the WMAP data is not dark matter either. It's instead produced by something like a high energy jet of you know, either supernova explosions or some sort of uh, activity involving the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So that's kind of where this story is going now. And here's another way that these things can fall apart. Dark matter story never got disproven. There's nothing wrong with modeling this with dark matter. There's just another better astrophysical explanation that explains stuff more clearly. And so, you know, as theorists, we should we should focus on things that uh, don't have you know very obvious astrophysical explanations anymore. And the W and that case is not one of those. The other thing you can look at. So we we looked. Uh, let me go back actually in a second. We looked above and below the galactic center. We masked out the galactic center itself, which is messy. Um, for this WMAP case, but we could target and look really, really close to the center of our galaxy using radio observations. This is uh, the very large array, very creatively named also, because um, it's a big array. Um, and it, it looks for radio signals at low energies. And one thing about radio telescopes is they have absolutely superb angular resolution. So Fermi, we talked about, um, has an angular resolution of about a degree. Means if a, uh, I'm looking at that light there, I can tell, I can't really tell whether the light is there or if it's over there a little bit, off by about a degree, where a degree is about the size of the full moon in the sky or something like that. Um, our eyes have an angular resolution that's a little bit better than, uh, it's around uh, one one hundredth of a degree. So your eyes actually have a better angular resolution than the Fermi telescope. And you know, if things are smaller than that, that's text that's too small for you to read, right? Because you can't tell if the N is smeared off over there, it looks more like a Q or something. So that's the angular resolution of our eyes. The uh, angular resolution of one of these things is like one ten thousandth of a degree or better. Uh, no, better. One one hundred thousandth of a degree on this guy. So they can tell very, very finely. It's, it's actually the ability to see a quarter in San Francisco from Los Angeles. <laughs> Um, so they make a map of, say, the center of our galaxy, and I mean, it looks incredible, right? So here, here's the center of our galaxy in radio. Um, the galactic plane is this way in this map, because it's, it's shown on the horizon. Um, so let's see here. So this is the black hole at the center is here, it's Sag A. It's actually there, it's not in this really bright section, it's a little bit below it. Um, there are these cool things called filaments, you can see they're jutting out here. Uh, I don't have time to talk about them, but they are pretty awesome. Um, there's this, uh, let's see, there's a supernova that went off uh, here and it made this shell of gas. Here's another supernova here. Um, what else is on this picture? There's probably all sorts of cool things. Uh, there's another galaxy that's behind our galaxy, unfortunately. Um, means it never gets stuck because it's, you know, in this 
this over here. Uh, there's another supernova remnant or a possible one here. Uh, there's a really cool filament here that I studied once called the snake, and it kind of goes along the nuts through this area. Um, and uh, tons of data, and you can see like, uh, okay, this is half a degree here, this, this distance. Remember, Fermi smears things out by one degree. So everything smaller than about that looks like a point source to Fermi, and you can see how much you can zoom into this image and see really fine detailed structures. So, um, and, and you can zoom in way farther than you can tell in this picture uh, and, and see all sorts of stuff. That's great, <coughs> awesome angular resolution. We, we see a synchrotron from a dark matter event and we know exactly where it came from, but unfortunately we don't have the angular information about what that meant for dark matter anymore, right? Because this is dark matter produces charged particles we don't know how those charged particles bounced around before they produced the synchrotron radiation we're looking for. Um, so our instrument now has a great angular resolution, but our theory has a bad angular resolution. Um, so, you know, if you could do this in angular resolution in Fermi, dark matter would have been like, you know, blown out some years ago. Uh, but you can't. So, um, so, so we need to make a theoretical model for where we expect a dark matter signal to be. And um, most papers have concentrated on the very, very center, right next to the black hole at the center of our galaxy to look for dark matter. And the reason is, remember we said the dark matter density rises as you go closer and closer to the center of our galaxy. It looks like this. Uh, this blue line here for NMW is the one that everyone uses. Um, so here's dark matter, say one, uh, kiloparsec away from the center of our galaxy, uh, so like 3,000 light years. And you see that there's uh, about 100 times more when you get down to, say, only 10 parsecs or maybe 30 light years from the center of our galaxy. And then if you go even farther in, if you go to, say, 1 100th one of a parsec, it goes up by another factor of 100. Um, and how much dark matter annihilates goes as the square of the density of dark matter, because I need two particles to come together and annihilate. And uh, that means that I expect lots and lots of dark matter annihilations really close to the center of the galaxy. Well, the magnetic field is also really strong near the center of our galaxy because there's lots of stuff going on. Lots of supernova, lots of high energy stars, a huge black hole. They make magnetic fields. Um, so um, if I look closer and closer to the center of my galaxy, I get more and more signal. Um, here's my normal plot at the dark matter density, or dark matter mass here going from a proton mass up to 40 proton masses. Here's the cross section. Here are different constraints. If the dark matter stops increasing in density at 10 parsecs away from the center of our galaxy, center of the Milky Way, five, two, one, et cetera, et cetera. The reason, this is really important because I get more and more signal as I get closer and closer into the center, but also I don't know how far this dark matter picture works, and my simulations don't work at these really small scales anymore for how dark matter is supposed to form structure. So I expect, I, I don't know, there's model uncertainty, so they plot this. But notice, this is 10 to the, 10 to the minus 26. Uh, our thermal cross-section, the one that we said dark matter annihilates at, if it wants to produce the right density of dark matter in our universe, is at three times 10 to the minus 26, it's way up here. And the constraints are way down here. So it looks like synchrotron um, from the galactic center might rule out everything. Um, and that would be true if I trusted that dark matter continues to glob this close into the galactic center, if it continues to form this really dense profile. And people have known this for a while. Uh, Brigman uh, this year is not the first to bring this up. I just used his name there. Um, and everyone has said, well, we don't know if this is even true, or maybe it's 100 parsecs or 200 parsecs or something like that when everything changes. We don't have any real constraints there. So I said, people said, yeah, they're really strong constraints, but do we trust them or not? Um, and uh, recently, about two months ago, I, I worked on a paper uh, with Dan Hoover um, and some others, and we, we thought about, are those constraints actually that strong? And it turns out that no, they're not. I don't know why everyone's talked about this for so many years. Um, so yeah, magnetic fields get really strong. And the assumption had always been, Lots of dark matter electrons, magnetic fields are strong, so all the energy from the electrons that get produced to go directly into radio and synchrotron, and we see all of the electron energy in our telescope in radio. But what we found out is that the starlight energy density increases even faster 
than the, than, than the energy density that's in uh, the magnetic field. Now, I told you electrons have a couple different ways of losing energy. If the magnetic fields are strong, they can lose energy to, to synchrotron uh, radiation, spinning around in the magnetic field, and losing energy in radio. If the, um, if the starlight, if there's a lot of light, then they bounce off that starlight and they lose energy to those photons. And that doesn't produce radio, it produces gamma rays. Um, so if there's a lot more starlight than there is magnetic field in terms of energy, then dark matter produces a bunch of electrons still in the galactic center, but it doesn't produce a lot of radio signal that you would see. It produces a bunch of gamma ray signals um, that you would also see, except that it's uh, smaller than other things that produce gamma ray signals in that region. Um, so, okay. Um, so you wouldn't produce this same signal. So here was kind of their model of what they expected to rule out in terms of the dark matter mass again and how much dark matter annihilates. Uh, here's what they expected. We included that most of the electron energy actually goes into uh, up converting starlight into gamma rays, and here are the new constraints. And you can see that they changed by several orders of magnitude. Here is this uh, cross-section that you expected if dark matter uh, it forms the density of, uh, uh, if the dark matter density is formed in the early universe by this wind interaction, you see that's safe again. So, um, and, and, and it turns out that there's not even uncertainty in this calculation. We know exactly how many stars are in the center of our galaxy, or at least we know of all the bright ones. Um, we can count them, we can say they're this bright and they make this much light, and we just know that number. Uh, we don't know the magnetic field, uh, so maybe the magnetic field is even bigger than I wrote in this plot. Um, on the other hand, we actually took one of the biggest magnetic field models that had ever been written down and used that. And it turns out in all of those cases, you get very little uh, radio emission from the galactic center, and those constraints tend to not actually be that strong. So, um, to conclude, kind of for today, so doubly indirect dark matter detection is promising, but it's also really, really difficult. And it's really, really difficult because we formed the high energy charged particles in the center of our galaxy. But then what, what do they do? And we don't know because we don't know how the magnetic fields work. We don't know where all the gas is in our galaxy. We don't know how much these things bounce around before they leave. We don't know if there's some other wind that's pushing things out. There, there's more uncertainties that I've talked about today by like a factor of five. And, uh, you have to fold all of those into your analysis before you can even predict what, what signal you're supposed to see in order to set constraints. So it's really easy to find some sort of anomaly, and it's really easy to model with dark matter once you find it. Um, and some of these hints might even last. Antiprotons might be real. I uh, forgot to talk about our K2, but it might be real. Um, and then I left it in the conclusion slide. The positron fraction might, might actually be dark matter. Uh, we don't know yet. Um, and so careful modeling of all these astrophysics is, is necessary. We have to do a lot more on our understanding of what the universe is supposed to look like before we can look for anomalies. But it is exciting. There's a lot of things to do. So I'll conclude. Thanks. I keep hearing about something called the wind miracle. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. Um, so we, we quickly went over it a little extra The idea is that um, I, I have about six times as much dark matter in the universe as I have normal matter. Six times as many, much uh, density in dark matter as in protons, which form most of the whole universe. Um, why is that true? And if I just had the universe started and it decided I want this much dark matter and I want this much normal matter, why did it pick a number that's close to one? And so that suggests to us from theory that at the year of the universe, these things were coupled in some way, such that they sorted out that they want about the same amount of energy to be in both species. Um, otherwise, you just you have to pick that the universe was for no reason really specific that it wanted about the same amount, right? Um, so if the dark matter can talk to a uh, normal matter in the early universe, that, that's what I mean. Dark matter has to be able to somehow communicate how much they're supposed to be right, with, with, with normal matter. And that can happen through two dark matter particles annihilating like this and producing standard model particles, or two standard model particles producing dark matter particles. As long as that can freely happen in the early universe, 
then you get about the same amount of each out at the end. Um, if it turns out that you ask how strong does this interaction have to be so that I get about six times as much dark matter as normal matter out in the early universe, and it turns out that that has to be about the weak force, uh, which we know of as a normal force. Um, so you asked how strong how strong these interactions have to be. It, it's a miracle. They turn out to be the same strength as a force we already know exists. That's the weak miracle. And so that's why we talk about weakly interacting as in particles. But they have some sort of weak interaction. Yeah? It's been recently shown that uh, M and K class stars are the predominant bodies in our galaxy. Is there any uh, production of the secondary characteristics that you're looking for attributable to the uh, M and K class stars? Um, so when we talk about particles that are um, billion electron volts or more, um, so these are really high energy protons. This is like you know channeling the highest things that the Large Hadron Collider can produce, these sorts of energies, right? Um, stars are not very good at producing particles that have that high of an energy. Our, our, our sun limits out and produces almost nothing beyond about uh, a few million times, a uh, few million electron volts. Um, most stars of those classes are like that. The exceptions are things like supernova. So you know, there you get tons of energy, um, really strong magnetic and electric fields that can accelerate particles to really high energies really efficiently. So stars aren't, aren't so, such an important background. But stuff that stars form, like supernovas, like pulsars, are really important. So how many of each type of star you have in different parts of the galaxy is really important. Uh, but not because of the stars themselves, because some of them eventually make supernovas. Yeah. In the electron photon solutions, who gains the energy and who loses it? Is it always in the same direction? Uh, in electron and photon? Photon. Um, the, they tend to uh, balance out, basically. Balance. So if the electron starts with more energy, um, it distributes some of its energy to the photon. If the photon starts with more energy, um, and, and uh, depending on how uh, uh, comfortable people are with special relativity, um, this is, this is uh, somewhat easy to explain. So I have uh, an electron that's moving really fast compared to me, some observer over here. Right? And I have a photon that doesn't have a lot of energy. Um, it's still moving at the speed of light, but we won't worry about that for a second. This electron collides with this uh, photon, and they both exchange energy and they kind of start moving at a closer velocity than they used to, well, this velocity compared to me is now slower. Now I could switch this and have, well, the electron started very slow velocity compared to me. Photon came in. In the, in the frame where they were both moving with equal energies, they did the exact same thing as they did before, but now the electron is now moving faster. So it's the exact same collision, just really in two different frames compared to me as an observer. Yeah. Does it make sense to speak of the temperature of dark matter, and if yes, what is it? Good. Uh, yes. Um, not not for things that we um, not for the particle creation. It doesn't matter. Um, but the temperature matters because it tells you how fast a dark matter particle is moving around our galaxy in general. Um, if dark matter was really really hot, that means the individual particles would be moving very fast compared to each other and in different directions. If that happens, then in the early universe, it's very hard to have the dark matter fall in to form a dense structure. So one of the early explanations for dark matter was maybe it was neutrinos. Neutrinos uh, don't interact with light, so they make a nice dark particle. Um, and even though they're individually light, there are lots and lots of them. They could maybe make the mass up of dark matter. The problem is neutrinos all move nearly the speed of light which means that they're very hot in, in some sense. Their velocities with respect to each other are very high. Uh, and that means that um, neutrinos can't collapse and form a you know, dense object because I, I have a couple extra neutrinos here, but a neutrino just goes straight through. It doesn't, doesn't decide it wants to you know, join in gravitationally and form a structure. Which means that if, um, 
you model how the universe would look if the dark matter was moving really fast, you wouldn't see all this really dense structure form like dark matter halos and galaxies and stuff like that. Everything would be much more diffuse and it wouldn't have collapsed. So that's, that's why we call, this, uh, we call these models cold dark matter models. Yeah? So is there any way one can assign the number of temperature in Kelvin? Uh, yeah, it, you can set a limit in, and I don't know the number in Kelvin, I know the number in electron volts. Um, of the mass of the dark matter particle, which is that it, the dark matter particle has to be at least uh, about four, four electron volts in mass. And that tells me that when the dark matter froze out, you can, you can calculate when the dark matter started moving on its own and not interacting anymore. And at that point, it had to be mostly mass with very little extra energy in terms of motion. I can give you a velocity at some point. We can also guess the velocity of dark matter in our galaxy, and the dark matter particles are moving about 200 kilometers a second or so, 300 kilometers a second, which is about the same as the velocity of our star, uh, our star called the sun, around, uh, around the center of our galaxy. Um, yes? Uh, I believe the theory is that in the early universe, there's an equal amount of antimatter and matter, and now, as you point out, for every million photons, there's only one anti-proton, so that kind of leads a couple of questions. One, where did the missing antimatter go? And the other thought connected to this class, is there some kind of a theory or relationship between that missing antimatter and dark matter? Did it possibly annihilate to help create dark matter? Yes. Uh, to answer the two questions, the first one, if I knew I had a, I'd have a Nobel Prize. And secondly, uh, um, Yes, there are theories where you link the, the dark matter um, to the lack of observed antimatter. Uh, either by making the dark matter an antimatterish particle. Um, in that case, dark matter doesn't annihilate, so you don't get these sort of signals, but you have a theory now. Um, and uh, another by having more dark matter form than dark antimatter in the early universe for some reason, and then having the interactions of those dark matter particles propagate to produce more matter than antimatter. So you can do it either where dark matter is predominantly matter or where dark matter is predominantly antimatter um, and make these sorts of models. So a lot of people have written them down. And then there's a whole other kind of part of physics called uh, studies of what we call baryogenesis, which is why you get baryons in the antimatter. So basically the genesis of this anomaly. Um, and um, so a lot of people study that. There are some interactions that have been found where dark matter, or sorry, sorry where particles and antiparticles don't behave exactly the same way. And so those particles can create the asymmetry that produces eventually more matter in the universe than antimatter. And it turns out that you only need about, in the early universe, you need about one extra proton um, per billion equal numbers. You need about a one in a billion excess in over to create everything you see in the matter and antimatter. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Is inverse constant scattering constrained to fermions or does it extend to baryons as well? Um, so inverse constant scattering is any any charged particle interacting with light. Um, the charged particles that we consider are electrons, which are fermions, which are direct particles. Um, I think, um, by, by, so baryons are also fermions. I, I, so um, like a proton will have inverse Compton scattering, if that's um, what you're asking. So, um, but the inverse Compton scattering depends, it goes inversely as the mass of the particle. Uh, and actually it's the square of the mass. So electrons create inverse Compton scattering uh, one million times more often than protons. Um, so that, this is one of the reasons why electrons lose energy really efficiently as they move around the galaxy and protons don't. It's because protons are relatively heavy. Yes? Uh, since uh, dark energy is a significant percentage of the universe and is considered responsible for the increasing rate of expansion of the universe, um, how is it possible to analyze dark matter in all these models without reference to dark energy? We have dark energy in all these models, I mean, in some sense. Um, dark energy 
is not an important contribution to the energy on the scale of a galaxy. So um, dark matter clumps um, and form structure. Um, so you know the dark matter density near us in, in the sun, uh, near near the sun, for instance, is you know um, thousands of times higher than the dark matter density in between two galaxies, just floating out of nowhere. Maybe maybe a million. I don't actually know that number of I have as much more than that here. Dark energy we think is the exact same energy density here is everywhere in between the galaxies. So while dark uh, energy overall has most of the energy density in the universe, in places like galaxies, galaxy clusters, planets, etc., that have structure, we think dark matter is much higher energy density. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so uh, the next two weeks I won't be here. Uh, the last week I'm going to give an entirely self-biased talk about um, my own research program for uh, dark matter uh, indirect detection at the Galactic Center in Gamma Rays. Um, it's uh, a, a group of papers we've worked on for the last uh, couple of years. Um, with some really exciting results. Uh, hint, they might have found dark matter. So uh, come on. <laughs> come on.